Good evening, everyone. I'm Yi Jing Li from Adobe Research. So this work is about fast video multi-style transfer. So the goal of video transfer is to recompose the content video with the style from reference image. So there's a bunch of existing works that on this topic. So the first branch is applying image stylization methods in a frame-by-frame -frame way. However, we observe that there will, this will cause severe flickering issue and lacks temporal coherence. The second branch is some fast single style methods that train one model for one style example. So it is limited on one style example and has uh, zero generalizations. So in this work, we propose a fast and coherent video style transfer for multiple styles. So this is a pipeline framework. We build upon the encoder decoder network. So during the training, we stylize two frames together and use the existing flow estimator to regularize the flows. So in the encoder decoder, we specifically design two modules. So first one is a multi-ion block, where the ion here indicates instance normalization, normalization layer. We use one ion layer to learn one style example. The second module is a convex TM to learn and keep hidden states of the previous frame so that we are able to achieve coherent style transfer. For the last functions, we first inherit from previous work to compute the perceptual loss and the total variation loss. To encourage the temporal co coherence, we use the temporal loss in both short term and long term. So basically, the temporal loss is about warping the stylized first frame and we're trying to reduce the difference with the stylized second frame. We first provide some quantitative results compared with previous methods in terms of user preference and warping narrow. So both metrics show that our method achieved the best performance. On the right, we show the runtime of method equipped with the GPU. Our method runs quite fast on different image resolutions. So this is an example of viral comparisons. So it clearly shows that our method contains much fewer flickering while transferring the style on left faithfully. More styles transfer results of method are shown here. So note here, we use just one single model to work on those style examples. With one single network, we can also interpolate between different style examples to create new style effects. So to conclude, we propose a fast and coherent video style transfer method for multiple styles. So the largest number we tried in this work is now 120. So for future work, we will continue to extend explore how to extend multiple to arbitrary. So the key challenge is how to learn a good motion feature from our original content video. So welcome to our poster for more discussions. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Trung Nghĩa Le from University of Tokyo. I'd like to briefly introduce to you our work of video object annotation. As you know, deep networks require a large amount of training data with proud truth However, manually collecting object annotations is a time-consuming task, so it is essential for the development of effective annotation frameworks to generate desired route through for large-scale video datasets. And this project would like to tackle this problem of video object annotation, where human annotates some examples and then machine learns to generate the remains. In this work, we propose a novel interactive self-annotation framework which aims to cut down both time and human labor costs for video object body box annotation. This framework consists of two processes. The supported process trains a strong detector adaptively to each video. After that, we put human into an interaction loop between human and machines so that detector can learn modification from human annotator. We have three contributions. We propose the automatic process based on self-supervised learning and the interactive process. We also introduce a new metric for the text. Our goal is to generate body parts for all objects in videos by letting a detector watch unlabeled video repeatedly. At each iteration, the detector trend from the previous iteration generates boring parts for all videos. We introduce labeling a system module to leverage temporal consistency from the video to filter out this boring box, resulting in new pseudo pro truth boring box for fine tuning the detector again. The new pseudo pro truth boring box have better quality than pro truth at the previous iteration, which leads to the improvement in training the detector for the next iteration. We aim to address humor in the large annotation scenario 
where the detector receives guidance from the human annotator to run on the right track. So we propose the interactive recurrent annotation which leverage strengths of both automatic process and human guidance, resulting in low annotation cost. The main advantage of our method is that it allows an annotator to easily interfere at any time if a mistake occurs to help the detector to get back to the right track. On an average precision metric for object detection only focuses on objects of interest without concerning background. They ignore all noise detection, where detected parting parts do not touch ground truth. Hence, the, these metrics are not appropriate to evaluate the text of annotation. We consider the global context. So we introduce a new metric called similarity in union for the task. Here are the results of our proposed method. Please come to our poster for more details. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Chen Liang Xu from University of Rochester. And I'm here to present a collabor uh, collaborative work with people in Discovery. Um, so can we design an automatic method that can assist both professional fashion designers and ordinary consumers for the task of you know, creating fashion garments? And our paper answers this question. So given a image, a base image on the right, and a reference design in the middle, our goal is to generate a new image that takes the overall look of the base image, but with the design of the reference image. So our framework consists of a uh, two-stage trainings. So in the first stage, we employ a self-supervised reconstruction. We decompose the original image into a edge image and a masked image. And we try to use an encoder-decoder structure to reconstruct the self. In the second stage, we take this masked image and combine with a novel uh, color type, and we generate that with a GAN network. And it is driven by different loss functions, including the GAN loss functions, and attribute prediction for different uh, color types. So to solve this task, uh, we propose a new data set called garment set that contains uh, clean garment fashions. Um, and we have labeled different types of the columns and different uh, sleeve types, including both long sleeves and short sleeves. And our data set is publicly available. So here are some results by changing the color type. And you can see that we have the original image uh, and the, it's uh, its edge of the color, and a reference image that contains a designed color type. And here is a more results on switching the sleeve types from short to long and long to short. And we also show our model is able to generalize to unseen color type by training uh, in a leave one out fashion. And thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Kranti from IIT Kanpur, India. I'll be presenting our work on audiovisual zero sort classification and retrieval of videos. So, zero sort learning is the task of learning to classify data not seen during training. And it is usually performed using side information in the form of attributes or text. So the mot motivation for this work comes from the, the existing zero sort learning approach is limited to visual modality only. Although this approach is optimal for images, but this is not optimal for videos which contains an accompanying audio signal along with it. And also the human perception is in general multimodal where we take both audio and video information to infer about a scene. So taking a cue and inspiration from this human learning approach, 
we plan to use the multimodal framework for doing the zero sort learning where we embed all the three modalities audio video and text onto a common embedding space this is done by extracting the features from a pre-trained network and once the feature is extracted we use three different losses two triplet loss and one cross model alignment loss to align all the three modalities and finally at the test time we take the distance from both the audio and video modality from the corresponding text embedding to get the final class level for that given input example. Although this approach of adding the distance from both the modality seems the obvious one to infer the class level, but it severely degrades the performance when one of the modality is corrupted. So we propose a to you uh, attention prediction network to find out the dominating modality out of both and and during the classification, we use the dominating modality to get the final class label. Here is some of the qualitative results for <laughs> other So this is, and here is a video dominated example where you can see there is no accompanying audio or the audio is not the discriminative. And finally, for the results for the classification, we found out that uh, our approach using attention is at par with a much heavier network which takes into account both audio and video modality to find the class label and is also better than the baseline method where you are, where you are not using any of the attention method. And finally, we also use it for a cross <laughs> where given a train audio we are trying to find out whether the class label uh, different video signals so these are the retrieval examples for the given audio signal these are the semantic retrieval and although the retrieval is not perfect but it ca captures the semantic information on both the modality so thank you visit our poster for details Hello everyone, my name is Tite Datta and this talk is about our work on sketch based image retrieval with an additional style condition which we term as style augmented SBIR or SSBIR. Here is a brief introduction to the application we addressed. Traditional SBIR queries a sketch against a set of natural images. However, SSBIR further restricts that search with an additional style keyword given by the user. Hence, in comparison to the traditional SBIR, where training data includes only sketch images and their labels, we require additional instance-wise style annotations for images. In the first step of the model, we fine-tune two VGG19 networks on sketch and image data separately and extract their features. These features are then passed through an autoencoder network where the encoded space is the shared latent space between both domains. This space is learned with the category level supervision of the samples. In addition to that, we consider reconstruction losses between the features at the input of the encoder and at the output of the decoder. Next, we concentrate on the style extraction part of the framework. We obtain the activation maps from the initial layer of the CNNs fine-tuned on images and put them through an encoder to learn the style information of the image sample. This style is again learned with the supervision of the image instance level annotations. Finally, we pass both the learned styles and category through a mixer network which produces the composite feature of a sample. This feature space is learned using a novel quintuplet loss where the quintuplet set is formed according to the matched category and style of the images with the query set as displayed in the picture. While testing, all retrievals are performed at this composite feature space. We now introduce the modification in evaluation metric. Let's consider these two retrieval examples where traditional MAP scores them both equally as one. However, the image in B should be penalized as the color of the same is not matched with the query. We introduce this style consideration in evaluation metric through a style score. And here is an example of how it makes a difference in case of style augmented SBIR. For training the proposed model, we used a subset of two large scale datasets, Sketchy and TU Berlin. These subsets contain images for which instance level style annotations are available. We display some of the results using both traditional and proposed metric and we observe that the proposed model performs the best in all cases. Here are some of the retrieved images using our proposed framework. Here is some more with more than one style criteria in the query. This concludes the brief walkthrough for our work. Thank you for listening.
Hi all, good evening. I am Siddharth from Triple IT Hyderabad and will be presenting a work titled Unsupervised Image Style Embeddings for Retrieval and Recognition Tasks. Style understanding and similarity is an important measure for many tasks like neural artistic style transfer, style in fashion, a visual product search. In visual arts, style is used to relate, organize and describe artworks. However, understanding of style is highly contextual and vague. Depending on the context, sense of style is attributed to time period, culture, technique, modality, emotion, etc. A highly subjective construct like style is hence difficult to model computationally. Strong supervision works well, but requires large-scale labeled image data sets for all classes. Data labeling is tedious and costly. Prediction is possible on the training classes only. And getting predefined labels is not always suitable for a subjective notion like style. So we asked ourselves the question, can we learn style of an image automatically? Karaya et al. presented one of the early works for image style recognition. They train linear classifiers on features extracted from deep features pre-trained for object classification. It is a supervised training protocol with predefined style labels. Colomas et al. Uh, train a Siamese network with triplet loss to perform style aware image retrieval. Again, follow supervised training with predefined labels. Vinan et al. recently show automatic discovery and manipulation of style. They perform archetypal analysis on deep features extracted from pre-trained CNNs. This method does not use any predefined class labels or label data. Similar in spirit, we propose an unsupervised protocol for learning a neural embedding of visual style of images. As a first step is forming data clusters. We extract features from a pre-trained CNN trained for the task of object classification, perform PC on the extracted features to reduce them to a manageable size, Finally, perform k-means clustering, where k is determined by the Elbow method. The output of this stage is clusters with stylistically similar images coming together. Step two, we use, grouping, use this grouping to form triplets, which are later used in training. More details are given in our paper. We follow a two-stage training protocol, a softmax classification loss where the cluster IDs are used as class labels, followed by a triplet loss uh, using the triplets formed in the previous stage. We achieved top retrieval performance overall on six data sets and top recognition performance on four out of five data sets. A few of our qualitative results will follow, where the first image is the query followed by the top three retrieve results. In future, we wish to explore hierarchies in style learning and its application in fashion image search, uh, visual product search, etc. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Gaurav. I'm here to present my work I did at Microsoft on animating face using disentangled audio representations. The task of talking head generation refers to generating an animated sequence given a face and audio speech sequence. Animation for speech containing background noise and variations in emotion such as sad, happy, angry, etc. has been little explored. In that regard, we present a novel disentangle audio representation learning framework for talking head generation that is robust to noisy and emotionally rich audio. Our method uses a variational autoencoder to model audio by learning the distribution over the content, emotion, and sequence level representations via separate encoders. We introduce a discriminative objective to have variables learn non-trivial variations for content and emotion. To further disentangle the variations, we introduce margin ranking loss to maximize the softmax probability scores of content and emotion predicted condition on respective random variables. Once we have the VAE learn the encodings for content emotion, we use the samples from the learn content variable to conditionally generate talking head frames using a generative adversarial network framework. We evaluate our method on grid and in the while LRS3 datasets using facial landmark distance as the metric on audio sequences modified to have different levels of noise. Compared to several baselines and state-of-the-art approaches, we found a method to be able to achieve lower values of landmark distance for much higher levels of noise in the audio sequences.
Now here we have an animation for an audio sequence with sad emotion where we can observe our method outperforming the state of the art with much better synchronization and wider mouth movements. Maybe tomorrow it will be cold. Maybe tomorrow it will be cold. Now we have an animation for a sequence with minus 40 decibels of noise added to the audio where we can again observe our method outperforming the state of the art with much better synchronization and wider mouth movement. Maybe tomorrow it will be cold. Maybe tomorrow it will be cold. Now here are some more generated results by our method. Place white by I8 now. Don't forget a jacket. Play screen at J0 soon. Thank you and please visit our poster for further questions. Good evening everyone. I am Vikram Singh, a research scholar from IIT Madras, India. And I am here to present my work titled High Frequency Refinement for Video Super Resolution. Our work proposes a video super resolution network designed on the principle of explicit refinement and fusion of high frequency details. First, the network creates an intermediate upsampled frame. Next, it separates the frame into two frames with high and the low frequency details. The high frequency frame is then refined and fused with the low frequency frame to generate the final prediction. The network consists of five stages and takes seven consecutive low resolution frames to upsample the central target frame. The first stage of the network performs two types of motion warping, namely direct and the sequential warping. The second stage refines the features of motion warped data for upsampling. The third stage performs the actual upsampling. The fourth stage separates the intermediate upsampled frame into two frames having high and the low frequency details using Sobel filters and then refines the high frequency frame. The fifth stage fuses the refined high frequency frame and the low frequency frame coming from stage 4. This stage is trained in two phases, the progressive phase and the retrogressive phase. In the progressive phase, we fuse the low frequency frame with the high frequency frame that we extract from the ground truth. Thus, after the progressive phase, the network generates very good results as its input comes directly from the ground truth. However, the ground truth is either not available or not allowed to be used during inference. And so, we retrain the network in the retrogressive phase where we train it to work without the requirement of the ground truth high frequency frame at the input. In the retrogressive phase, we gradually replace the high frequency frame extracted from the ground truth with the refined high frequency frame coming from stage 4. By the end of retrogressive phase, the network does not depend upon ground truth input to make the prediction and can thus be used for inference like any other conventional super resolution network. The output of this stage is the final prediction of our network. We can see on the screen that our network gives better and sharper results than existing approaches. Thank you. Do visit our poster and read our paper to know more about our work. Hello everyone. I would like to start my presentation with a question. Have you ever noticed that it's hard to have eye contact during a video call? This is because people don't usually look into the camera during a call. What they do is that they look at the other person's image on their display, or they even look at their own preview image, but not into the camera. In a typical video conferencing setup, the camera and the display are not aligned with each other. And this camera display user geometry creates a gaze disparity that makes it hard to maintain eye contact. We propose an eye contact correction model that restores the eye contact, regardless of the relative position of the camera and display. Our model redirects the gaze from an arbitrary direction to the center, out of the box, without any calibration. Let's take a look at how, how the overall flow looks like. 
We use a facial landmark detection model to detect and crop the eyes, and we feed those cropped eyes into our eye contact correction model, which is a convolutional neural network that outputs a vector field. Then we use those vectors to warp and tune the eyes in the input frames. We also, we also use a set of control mechanisms to ensure a smooth and natural video conferencing experience. The control mechanisms manipulate the input vector field to avoid doing any unnatural correction. For example, we smoothly disable correction when the user is blinking, or if the user is looking somewhere distant, like you see in this example. We also apply temporal filtering using an alpha beta filter to ensure temporal stability. Our model preserves details such as glasses and eyelashes without hallucinating the details that do not exist in the input. Our system supports a wide variety of video conferencing capable devices having different display sizes and camera placements. Whether your camera is located at the top left, center, or right corners of your device, our model works without any calibration. We trained our model using a combination of natural and synthetic data. We collected over 3,000 gaze pair sequences from 200 people to create a natural data set. We also generated a synthetic data set that consisted of over 2.5 image pairs from 3,200 artificial subjects with random traits and lighting conditions. We used a generative adversarial network to refine the synthetic samples in our data set. The refined synthetic samples looked virtually indistinguishable from the natural ones. Using this process, we were able to create an immense amount of data at a minimal cost. To prevent this model from modifying the input images beyond repair, we trained it in a bi-directional way that enforced mapping reversibility. Our model learned how to move, move the gaze towards one direction and to revert it back to its original state to reconstruct the original input image simultaneously. This training setup reduced the artifacts and resulted in a more natural gaze correction. Thank you for your attention. Take a look at our paper to learn more. If you have any comments and questions, come find me at the poster session. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Omar Sumar from University of Tübingen. Uh, I will present our work, uh, Attention Flow and to and Joint Attention Estimation. It's a joint collaboration with University of Tübingen and Leibniz Institute. First, uh, the, let's start uh, the definition of the problem. Uh, so do we estimate the joint attention in the third person social scenes, the videos. And the joint attention is defined as the social interaction that can occur in the forms of dyadic or the triadic ways. And it starts actually uh, in the age of the, the three months. Uh, it has the wide, uh, the wide application, uh, applications, uh, applications such as uh, classroom analytics, uh, learning, uh, learning assessment, and uh, also uh, some uh, other applications. So the, here you see an input R uh, RGB, uh, RGB scene. So we, we, try to, we try to estimate two channel heat maps for a given RG RGB image. The first channel is, uh, it represents the face likelihood, and the second is, uh, co-attention likelihood of the persons in the scene. And we use actually uh, to get the, the grant root, the sal estimated saliency of the scene. So the, here you see uh, our model is composed of three, uh, three modules, the feature encoder, attention flow of generator, and the saliency based grant root uh, estimator. So uh, in the third block, we uh, create or uh, the grant root labels based on, uh, based on estimated scene, uh, estimated the saliency map of the scene and uh, face locations and Co-attention, uh, co-attention location. In a uh, feature encoder, feature encoder, we have a pre-trained network, and based on this representation, our generator generates these two channel attentions. Uh, before and after the generator, we use the channel-wise feature attention and the special attention. The first one can be considered as the feature selection method, and the second, uh, second is uh, helping uh, to get the more precise uh, the localization of our attention flows. Uh, we conduct our experiments on video co-attention data set uh, that contains uh, video sequences from uh, 20 different uh, TV shows and the hundred thousands of frames. So we have two different tasks, detection and the localization of joint attention in videos. Uh, we conducted uh, quant uh, quantitative uh, 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 experiments that based on, uh, the first of all, actually, the contribution of uh, channel-wise attention and the special attention for uh, joint attention estimation task. And also, we compare the, the, our work with, with uh, the previous methods, such as the gaze follow and the more complicated temporal met methods. Uh, we outperform, actually, in both tasks. 
So the, here you see the some qualitative results. Uh, for any given RGB, uh, RGB inputs, uh, you see the faces and the joint attention channels of or attention flow outputs. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please visit our poster for more detail. Researchers from Nagoya University and AIST. Our project is titled PSNet, a style transfer network for point cloud stylization on geometry and color. What we are doing in this project is stylize a point cloud with another point cloud. Suppose we are given two. One is treated as content, the other is treated as style. We hope to capture the general shape or color property and transfer it to this car. The stylization either resulted in a geometry varied content or color varied content or both. The difficulty in this project is how can we capture the general feature information of a point cloud and reflect it to another point cloud. We know that in image stylization, we can use components to grasp the feature of an image and transfer it to another. But point cloud, on the other hand, has every regular data structure. It's not grid like. Our solution is to use a two-stream pointnet based network. It's pointnet based because we find it can capture the general shape and color distribution. By two-stream, we mean that the geometry part, XYZ, and the color part, RGB, is separately handled. The two parts are separately hand passed through a series of layers and are concatenated eventually. After training, the network is used in stylization. If we want to stylize the geometry, then we only use the geometry root, and similarly for the color part. Here we show some stylization results from point cloud to point cloud. The left column is the content. The style row shows the style point cloud. We can see that in the general shape and or color distribution in the style point cloud is successfully transferred to content point cloud. We show another example. This time, the color distribution in the image is transferred to point cloud. An image where it has gray-like structure can also be similarly treated as a set of pixels. Therefore, images can also be the input to our network. In this case, our network also captures the distribution in the image and convert it to point clouds. We show a video here to demonstrate more details of the result. A larger indoor scene is now used as content. The images around are treated as style. We can see the color of the scene is vividly stylized by our method, which verifies the effectiveness of, of our methods. We argue that the advantage of our proposal is first, it's flexible. The color or the shape property can be separately stylized. Secondly, our method is tunable. We can control the degree of the style in the result by tuning just one parameter. For more technical details or results, welcome to our poster session, 1150. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I am Omid. I present our work Neural Puppet Generative Layered Cartoon Characters. Animating 2D characters requires a lot of manual effort. Our goal in this work is learning to animate characters with minimum expert supervision. There are challenges in cartoon data such as lack of texture and piecewise constant color. There are also opportunities such as existence of large data sets of cartoon characters. So in our approach, the user provides a set of unlabeled images and a layered template mesh, and the model generates interpolated frames and user-constrained deformation. We use a two-state generation approach with a deformation network, which deforms a template mesh based on the input pose, and appearance refinement network, which um, refines the rendered image. This is our architecture. The deformation network takes the initial mesh and input image, and predicts the vertex offsets and adds it to the initial vertex position. Uh, faces and textures of the initial mesh are reused and added to the um, initial vertex positions and passed to the neural render. The rendered image is compared to the input image with L2 reconstruction loss and we also use joint loss for proper connectivity of the mesh and ARAP regularization term. And then pass this to a GAN for refinement. 
Here we show results on train and test samples for different characters and compare it to optical flow approach, PWCNet, and a deformation approach, DAE. Here we show results on additional characters. In terms of average L2 distance to ground truth, our method outperforms the baselines. We can linearly interpolate between encoded latent vectors to generate smooth deformations between any two poses of the character. We compare this to a nearest neighbor baseline and we outperform this baseline as we see. The user can also specify desired location for a point on the character and we use that in the loss function and do gradient descent in the latent space to minimize the loss function. We compare our approach to ARAP, a traditional deformation approach, and show that our method outperforms ARAP. We can also estimate correspondences between any pairs of frames via the template. Our method outperforms the existing baselines. Finally, the model can be extended to characters on custom background. We use the reconstruction loss uh, by using the rendered, rendered image to mask out the background as well as an area preserving term to avoid extreme deformation of the mask of the character. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Matthias Inman from the University of Erlangen in Germany, and I'd like to share our recent work on BRDF reconstruction. So photogrammetry studios are a common tool to achieve high quality using standard methods like structure for motion and multi stereo. These are photo studio-like setups with user-defined illumination and several hundreds of cameras, and the reconstruction of the geometry runs without any user interaction. But surface reflections is still an open topic, and it's very important to achieve high quality in games, movies, VR, and AR. Related methods uh, tackle these problems, but usually they uh, assume directional lights, for example, using spherical harmonics, which is not true in photogrammetry studios, because the lights are rather at a distance of one or two meters and not at infinity. And this leads that production uh, pipelines typically look like this. Either we have to manually paint the BRDF textures, which is, of course, time consuming and tedious, or we have to use expensive and precisely calibrated light stage setups. Our method works as follows. So we start with an input set of RGB images and run the photogrammetic reconstruction to achieve the geometry and an initial texture map. We also capture an HDR panorama of the photo studio and use a clustering method to achieve a low dimensional representation. With that, we estimate an initial diffuse albedo. And now we uh, jointly optimize for the light distances and for the surface reflectance and iterate this process until we converge. And now we have knowledge about the light setup in the studio and about the diffuse albedo and can estimate high quality spatially varying surface reflectance for the, object, so, uh, for the subject matter. We evaluate our method um, on synthetic data for the joint BRDF and light reconstruction where you can see that if we, if we initialize the uh, lights at the red points, we converge nicely to the ground truth and achieve a relative error of about 8% which corresponds roughly to 10 centimeters in that setup and we achieve a relative error of the BRDF parameters by about 2%. We also capture several real-world data sets where I would like to show some animations now. So first we see the estimated diffuse albedo for this upper body example. And I'd like to show two uh, example uh, layers of the BRDF, which is here the roughness layer. And I also like to show the clear coat layer, which uh, nicely corresponds to the physical properties. And with that, in hand, we can now generate uh, synthesized renderings for novel views, which look photorealistic. And here's a uh, yeah, another example, which, which is very challenging because we have sharp reflectance boundaries for this waste. And which, what is nice about this is uh, the BRDF parameters actually nicely correspond to the physical properties of that object, as you can see here. Thank you for your attention, and I'd like to see you at the poster. Hello everyone, I'm Ericsson. Today I will talk about transferring human motion appearance between monocular video using spatial and temporal constraints. The computer vision community have adopted learning techniques to automate the animation process. However, image-to-image -image translate methods do not transfer appearance jointly consider human motion and body shape. 
well people are different we have different shapes different size when you transfer only texture this is what you get so in this work our goal is synthesize a new video of a person in a different scene preserving the movement features and also retaining the visual appearance of the person our idea is to apply a, a model-based retarget approach that considers spatial temporal motion constraints, like this video. So our methodology is composed of four main steps, the motion estimation, the target, the target character uh, creation, the motion retarget, and finally the image composition where we put the target in the new scene. We create the, this three-dimensional model uh, of the target person and enhance the face detail using, again, uh, training the texture domain. Then we transfer the motion, applying the motion constraints to adapt the pose of the target, taking into account his or her shape. So here you can see we apply the motion constraint in the retargeted step. Uh, in the final image with the new person and the original background. So you can see that the retargeted step enforced the target pose to be adapted to the motion constraints, the red dots. So in the following some qualitative results, here are comparison against the variational unit on the left and our result on the right. And in this video sequence, uh, we have a moderate speed motion and also displacements in all directions. Then in this second video sequence, we test our approach with strong illumination chains and also fast motions. And finally, a video sequence with fast motion and partial occlusions of arms and feet. To see more videos and quantitative results, please come to see me in our poster. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone, I'm so honored to be with you to communicate academic questions and ideas. The title of my pre is Temporal Aggregation with Clip Level Attention for Video-Based Person Identification. I'm Li Meng Liu, come from Institute of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics, Xi'an Jiao Tong University. The work I shared today is a joint collaboration of IAIR and Deep North Inc. The research gap we focus on is person identification, which we call person ready in short. It aims to match a person across multiple non-overlapping camera views. Image-based person ready contains two tasks, feature representation and metric learning. A lot of research on this issue has made outstanding progress. However, video-based person ready has one more task, temporal modeling. Our work is to propose a simple and effective temporal modeling method, which greatly improves the performance of our model. This slide shows one certain checklist from dataset Mars. We divide the checklist into several clips. Each clip has four frames. Our model scores each clip through clip level attention module and weights the features of the entire checklist as checklist level feature. We can note that when severe occlusion occurs, clip level attention is descending to weaken the effect of the negative sample on the final feature vector. When the occlusion disappears, the clip level attention is increased to allow subsequent positive sample features to have more effect. It shows that by introducing clip level attention, our model can give out more representative feature vectors. This is the pipeline of our model. 
Each clip shares the same base model uh, to extract image level features. A weight predictor assigns clip level attention for each clip. During the training stage, softmax loss and chiplet loss are widely used to form matrix learning. Moreover, we adopt the min-max loss include our framework, which can noticeably improve the training efficiency. Experimental results on four benchmark datasets shows that our model has achieved significant improvements as compared with the state-of-the-art approaches. Thanks for your listening. Good evening. My name is Jan Zelinka. I am from University of West Bohemia. Our main goal is to make a system which synthesizes an utterance in sign language from a text. In our work, we focus on Czech sign language. I'd like to know that sign language differs on lexical level, but uh, it also has a different grammar and phraseology. Our other goal is to exclude every slow and demanding manual annotation. Our corpus consists uh, of weather forecast in Czech sign language and instead of generating video, we generate a sequence of skeletal models. At first, we extracted skeletal models from our videos. We used the open post toolbox. Even though the toolbox is relatively accurate, some fatal errors occurred. Uh, for this reason, we design and apply a backpropagation based method that uh, doesn't process videos per frames, but as a whole. The method extrapolates all missing joints and interpolates uh, misplaced ones. Uh, we deal with missing annotation, missing se segmentation, and with a problem that target videos are performed by different speakers. Our presented solution has two parts. The first part is a simplified non-recurrent differentiable layer uh, that decomposes words and allows us to produce sequence of poses. The second part is a neural network-based translator. We train both parts together. We tried to respect the diversity of speakers utilizing additional information that includes speaker identities. Uh, because the Czech language uh, is a highly inflexive language, we also try to utilize character level features. Uh, in our loss function, we use dynamic time warping uh, that synchronize outputs and target sequences. Because dynamic time warping is a hard and monotonic attention hat and such has some issues, uh, we invest investigated also some soft and non-monotonic attention hats. Uh, in, uh, our experiments show that significant benefit of uh, using the additional information and the benefit of the soft non-monotonic head. The ability of our system to produce the reasonable output can be seen in the ongoing example video. Uh, for more details, please visit our poster and thank you. Hello everyone, uh, this is our work, preference space image generation. Uh, I bet that uh, nowadays everybody knows about generative models like GANs or VAEs, but nobody can use these models to generate the exact image that they have the, in their minds. So here we are trying to propose a solution for that problem. Uh, it's preference space image generation, uh, which is a method to retrieve the code that can generate any image that you have in your mind. To do so, we develop a framework which is based on preference based uh, uh, reinforcement learning. We have a uh, reward network which tra we train it to mimic your judgments. And we also have a trainable latent code which we train it by maximizing the output of the reward network to generate the image that you have in your mind. Hopefully, this uh, whole process is completely decoupled from the uh, underlying generative model. So uh, you can use it with any pre-trained uh, GANs or VAEs or any other models. So to train the model, uh, our framework at each time step, it proposes uh, actually uh, generate two images and uh, gives to the user. And the user uh, 
compare these two images with the image that uh, they had in their mind and then um, says which of these two images is closer to the mental image. And based on the feedback from the user, we label these two images and then we train the network, the reward network, to mimic the same judgment that the user uh, already uh, gave to the network. And then we train, in the next step, we train the latent code to maximize the output of the reward network. So <coughs> if you wait, we can see some results, hopefully. Here are some results, and you can see how the output of the network evolved through the different steps and comparison from the first to the last step. It's around 100 steps. And then you can compare the last step with the goal image and also other techniques like uh, here nearest neighbor in the training data or ICGAN for uh, face generations. And you can see that pretty much most of the details are uh, in our last step uh, output, but not in other techniques if you compare. And uh, these, these are some other results from unseen uh, scenarios in which the user uh, haven't had access to the ground truths during the image generation, that just they use their own uh, memory to generate these images. And finally, in conditional setting, when part of the code is, uh, has some meaning and uh, the user can tune that with hands, uh, our network led them to uh, actually tune those parts of the code, and then we just search through the random code. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Hyungjin Jang from the University of Birmingham. I'm going to present our new work on bad post sonification for a view independent archery aid to blind rock climbers. <coughs> A visually impaired climber generally climbs with a sighted assistant whose role is to direct the climber verbally from the, from the ground. The primary aim for this work is to investigate the feasibility of replacing the sighted assistant with a computational aid. The proposed system makes use of a device called Moonboard. Firstly, the user points a camera at the Moonboard and performs a calibration. The user is then walked through the selected moonboard program as the system tracks their motion through the route. They're informed of the position of the next hold and given feedback as to the uh, direction and proximity of the next hold as they move towards it. Then the route planning is continued. In this work, we primarily focus on two particularly challenging aspects of the assistance role, which are skeleton tracking and archery feedback. Here are some details. We used open post for real-time bulk post tracking, and we reduced the tracking noise using combi combined filters and smooth the key point movement. The tracking, the tra tracking ske skeletons are projected to board space using a perspective projection. By monitoring the climber's movement, fall detection and goal completion detection are conti continuously performed. Then based on the tracking information, the system interactively provides auditory feedback to the climber via wireless headphones. We designed two auditory feedbacks. Verbal feedback gives a high level in instruction to the user to provide a rough estimate for where in space the goal is. And the tone provides feedback by which the climber can make the small adjustment needed to reach the goal precisely. In this work, we have implemented an in integrated system providing a video stream uh, with tracked body poses, a list of all routes, visualizing the climber in board space. We experimented with uh, applying our system to another whole body reaching task, Twister. This extension successfully provided a simulated climbing wall. Experimental results show that a user can learn to fo follow it in a relatively short time. Both spoken and tonal feedback provides uh, types were extremely important when completing motion. Thank you.
Uh, hello, my name is John Boshi. I'm from University of Pennsylvania. Today I'm going to talk about multimodal image outpainting with normalized diversification. And this is work done by my students, Lin Zhi and Jian Cong, who are busy writing a paper right now. Um, the problem is outpainting. So you have a, a little a snippets of the image, for example, eye and nose or cars, and you want to generate outpainting uh, from that. And the, the difficulty is that many multimodal distributions, uh, one little snippets might generate different outputs. And the difficulty typically we have uh, for many generations is called the mode collapse. And the whole paper is about how to come, uh, overcome this mode collapse problem. Um, sometimes it's too fast, sometimes it's too low, okay. Uh, so the technique is basically uh, consists of uh, two modules. One is an uh, encoding mechanism, encoding the snippets you have in front of you. And the other one is the main part, which is essentially is the memory of all the outpainting you could have done. Uh, this memory is encoded in a very low dimensional space with irregular samples. We introduced this called anomalized diversification, which look at four samples every time and try to force the four samples to go away from each other in output space relative to input space. So the last function here uh, consists of the uh, diversification function, which is explicitly try to make sure the latent variables are far away from each other to allow diversification uh, when well we introduce also other loss functions, uh, which make sure the diversification is centered around every sample you might have, instead of diversification uh, randomly. So here's the synthetic examples. Input is a, a, a very simple uh, X-shaped target, and uh, we want to map from those uh, random variable onto this X-shaped target. You can see very different type of GAN tend to have a different type of mode collapse problems. And our technique tend to have a very diverse uh, solution with the same number of samples you, uh, you, you obtain. So for a relatively low dimension example, this, this is actually fairly simple, but for uh, large dimension images, you can see later, this become difficulty. So here's the image out painting from the eyes nose. Uh, for bicycle GAN, VA GAN, they tend to be a severe mode collapsing. All the faces look the same. Uh, our technique tend to generate a very different uh, face out painting, all reasonables. Here's a, a sort of view f through a Tisney map, give you a better indication of what's happening. Again, you can see a uh, bicycle GAN, VA GAN tend to have these clumps of the results, tend to be uh, very collapsed on top of each other, where our solution tend to be fairly diverse uh, and spread out in the image space. Here are more examples. Um, so the goal is basically given an image of eye and nose, synthetically creates uh, the context of the face and the hairstyle, which mostly match with the eyes and nose you, you have. So, Here's an example for uh, street views. We can use the car as a seats and generate the entire street scene uh, based on those uh, cars and people. So thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Chen Lu from Expo Motors, a co-author of this paper. Our topic today is about learning to detect head movement in the unconstrained remote gaze estimation in the wild. Uh, so the problem we try to solve in this paper uh, is about uncon unconstrained remote gaze estimation. This problem remains challenging mostly because existing algorithms still have a hard time to cover a wide range of the head poles. Uh, so uh, many methods were presented previously to solve this ongoing problem. However, uh, some common problems still exist for this method. Uh, for example, they require control environment or cover only limited head post distribution. Uh, for example, appearance-based methods uh, need a lot of training data, and uh, the distribution of such data is typically biased. On the other hand, the model-based approach needs complex setting to make it applicable in the real-world scenarios. So in this paper, first we propose two methods to better incorporate head post information into a gaze estimation task. Uh, second, we also propose a large-scale uh, benchmark data set, which has a richer head gaze distribution. Uh, third, we conduct comprehensive evaluation on our data set and other data sets to show its superiorities. So uh, this one is the first proposed method in our system, the head post are wear gaze detector. Uh, this method is applied to scenarios where head movement information is available. Uh, thus, the model would have two streams of input, uh, each for eye and face. Uh, the model would incorporate features from both streams at different levels, including feature concatenation and multitasking. In this framework, head pose and gaze information is merged in a balanced way. These two streams uh, symmetrically proce process gaze and head pose features and fuse them at the hidden feature levels. So uh, this slide is our second method in our system, so HGD with no head pose. 
This is applied to scenario where head movement information is not available. So inspired by the model-based method, this method is pre-trained to reconstruct head pose and gaze from eye landmark features. The pre-trained eye and landmark data is generated by software and improved by SimGAN uh, to be more realistic. In the target data set, the guest detector would learn to incorporate those features to generate a more accurate guest pre prediction. As shown in this figure, our data set covers the largest sampling range for both head pose and the gaze in both directions. So uh, our method outperforms the state of the art in both our uh, in-car gaze data set and other public data sets. More evaluation method without the head pose information can be found in our papers. So as for the future, first we find an interesting correlation, correlation between the head movement and the eye patch deformation. We encourage more research into that direction. Second, we